in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and don't close the Bibles. If we get to it, we'll be back in this chapter in a few minutes. Um, but I want to read the first two verses. The Bible says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Here, the, the great apostle Paul is uh, assuming the role of the under-shepherd. He says, Be ye followers of me as I follow Christ. That's the key. If the man of God's following Christ, you follow the man of God. If he's not following Christ, Christ will take care of him. Promise you that. But look in verse number 2. This is the important verse for tonight. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. Here it is. And keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Paul had taught them the ordinances of the local church. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for taking good care of us. Thank you for this uh, holiday season we're about to embark upon, especially the day we'll celebrate tomorrow, the day of Thanksgiving. And God, it's a shame that some people only celebrate and only appreciate what you've done for them one day a year. But God, we find in the Scriptures daily you load us with benefits. And God, we certainly are basking far better than we deserve because of the bounty of the Lord. And we want to thank you for that. Thank you for the Scriptures. Thank you for these dear folks being here tonight. Be with those that are sick and afflicted, those that are traveling. Help us tonight. Enlighten our minds. Instruct us in the ways of righteousness. Help us, Lord, to embrace your truths. And we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want you... Uh, to notice that Paul uses the term in verse number 2, ordinances. Now, we will get to it, I promise you, at some point in this study on the importance of the Scriptures. But we have brought out what separates independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptists from everybody else as we take our doctrine from the Bible. We don't have a hierarchy. Jesus is the head of the church. And He gave us his word. Paul said, when that which is perfect shall come, that which is in part shall be done away with. What was he talking about? The word of God. And when it was finally pinned down and it has been passed down through the ages, it is the absolute and final authority for our, for our lives. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, uh, every major denomination, uh, uh, every major religion has a hierarchy who tells them what they believe. And as uh, time goes on and as uh, 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 life uh, throws changes and society throws changes, they keep moving the bar. They keep changing what they believe. We believe the same thing that Jesus taught, and we still stand on the same things that Jesus taught. And so what we do, we do everything biblically. It's very important. Um, now, listen, we've said several times already, from my flat head to my flat feet, I'm a Baptist. I'm an independent Baptist. But a lot of independent Baptists aren't right. I'm a Bible believer more than I'm an independent Baptist. I want to do what God says. And that's what's important in this study. So let's look at ordinances. We're going to start off by dealing with what the Protestants and what the Catholic Church deals with in regard to this term ordinance. And what's the Bible said? The ordinances uh, as I delivered them to you. Now, the Protestants and the Catholic Church have something called sacraments. There's a difference. Let me give you the definition of both. An ordinance is an outward rite instituted by divine authority given for perpetual observance. It produces no favor with God. It is a sign, a symbol, or a figure of the saving truth of the gospel. In other words, an, a, an ordinance is an outward manifestation of what the grace of God has done in your heart and in your life. Now let me give you the definition of a sacrament. The sacrament... Uh, definition is this, a right which confers grace and or produces holiness in the recipient. 
What they teach is that if you keep their sacraments, that it imputes grace to you, and it will impute holiness to you. And my dear friends, that's what we call works. If you do works, then you'll gain God's favor. Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I can do something to merit God's grace, then why did Jesus have to die the terrible death of the cross? If I could earn it, why did Jesus have to come at all? It's not of works. It's of grace. Now, the church of Christ teaches baptismal regeneration. They teach you're not saved till you're baptized. Well, again, if we had time, I'd take you to the Bible. When Jesus is hanging on Calvary, the thief on the cross next to him is railing on him and cussing him like everybody else in the crowd. But he watches Jesus for a couple hours. He listens to the things that Jesus says while he's hanging on the cross. Uh, and eventually, uh, under conviction of realizing he deserved to die on the cross, but Jesus didn't, uh, he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This is Jesus' reply. He said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That one thief on the cross accepted the Lord, got saved that day, died that day, was in paradise with the Lord that day, and he never got baptized. So does it take baptism to save you? No. Baptism can't save you. Again, it's an ordinance. It's an outward manifestation of what's... So that's important. I saw him waving. I thought, thought my, I was off. Okay, well, go get waving at me. Just say amen. The Catholic Church has seven sacraments that they say will confer grace and holiness to your life. One of the sacraments uh, is uh, uh, ordination. If you're ordained as a priest in the Catholic Church, then you get holiness and grace from that. But if ordination did it, I'm in good shape. But Miss Annette tell you, I'm not holy. Hmm? Uh, they also teach that confirmation. Uh, every young Catholic child will go through a series of classes, and then when they, they uh, uh, go through that, they, they have confirmation, and uh, they get their first communion. Uh, folks that join the Catholic faith from another faith, maybe as adults, they still have to go through these classes, and be confirmed, have confirmation in the Catholic Church that you've learned the dogma that they have taught you. And uh, they say that gives you grace. You get God's favor uh, for doing that. They also teach matrimony. And that's where we got the term holy matrimony. That's not a Bible term. But that's where we got the term from the Catholic Church, and they teach that marriage is holy. Now, marriage is a gift from God. As a matter of fact, God created the home before He created the church. And it's a blessing. And uh, the Bible says if a man finds a wife, he found a good thing. And the Bible has a whole lot to say on the home. has a whole lot to say about the role of the husband. A whole lot to say about the role of the wife. A whole lot to say about the role of the children. And, and the home is beautiful. And the home is a picture of the relationship between Christ and His church. Mm, but you don't get any special grace getting married. You need some grace after you get married, especially if your name's Doug, because you do a lot of things that you need grace, huh? Instead of uh, a frying pan, huh? Miss Annette and I was watching, uh, what is it, something about Raymond? It's always about Raymond, whatever. We never watched that show when it was on, but now it's on reruns, what we watch. I laugh. I like the old man. I like the old man, him and me. I like him. But last night, Raymond and his wife, what's her name, Deborah, was celebrating their 10th anniversary, and they, they went out for dinner. They come home. She wants to watch the wedding video again. So he plugs it in, and he taped the Super Bowl over it. 
wasn't good for Ray. He needed some grace that night. That's what I'm trying to say. There have been some days like that in my life. Are you listening? Hmm? Uh, another one of their sacraments is confirmation. Or I, I brought that matrimony. Extreme unction. Whereas if you get a vision or or if you get special power from God, uh, a touch from God, that, that's uh, grace and holiness. And uh, another thing is penance. Uh, you have to do certain things to gain God's favor in repentance. Uh, you've got to go to the priest, and he'll tell you you've got to say so many Our Fathers and so many Hail Marys, and you might have to climb the steps going up to Mount Auburn up there in Cincinnati. There's things that you do uh, uh, to bring humility on yourself to show God you're serious about, uh, uh, you know, seeking forgiveness. Well, they almost got it right. When God deals with you about your sin and you confess your sin, for, for the Bible says if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I don't have to pray 50 times for Him to forgive me. One time gets the job done. Matter of fact, the Bible even teaches about vain reputations in your prayers. It's very, very important to understand. The Bible also teaches that we're not to call any man father. Hmm? That's very important to understand uh, the truths of the Scriptures. The Bible goes, or I mean the Catholic Church also has a, a sacrament uh, concerning baptism. They believe baptism brings grace and holiness to your life. Uh, matter of fact, that's why they baptize infants. Because they want to make certain the infant is part of their church because what they really teach is salvation's in the church. Salvation's not in the church. Salvation's in a person, in Jesus Christ. Uh, and by the way, I'm not... Uh, it's, it's, The pretense behind baptizing an infant so that the infant is assured to go to heaven, that, that all makes sense. But if you study the scriptures, you realize uh, where much is given, much is required. And the Bible teaches, without using this terminology, an age of accountability. There comes a point in people's life when they can discern the difference between right and or wrong between good and evil until an individual reaches that age whatever it is it's different for every person until they reach that age they're safe they're not accountable for their sin because they don't know they're a sinner now some people it might be five some people it might be eight some people it might be twelve some people that have learning deficiencies a uh, uh, mental illness, they may never reach that age. They're still safe. You remember when Noah landed the ark? It rained 40 days and 40 nights, but they were on the ark for almost nine months, waiting for all the waters to sway and dry up. Well, when Noah got on the ark, they put supplies on the ark and everything. When they got off the ark, they, they opened up some of the wine that they put on there, but they'd never had anything other than grape juice. Well, being on that boat nine months, it fermented. Noah drank it, he got drunk. A heinous sin came about from that through one of his sons, but my whole point is, nowhere do you find where God judges Noah for getting drunk because he didn't know it would make him drunk. After that, he knew. Until you come to the knowledge of what's good and evil, God don't hold you accountable for it. You're safe. But after you reach the age of accountability, that's when you're accountable to God for your sins. That's when somebody needs to get saved. So it's very important. Um, I didn't bring out all the verses. I didn't plan on saying all that, but I just said it, okay? Now, the final sacrament the Catholic Church teaches brings grace and holiness is taking the Eucharist in the mass service itself. They believe that, that wafer confers grace to them. And 
we will teach on the Lord's Supper hopefully tonight and what it all really means, okay? All right. The two ordinances of the church, there's only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, some teach foot washing as an ordinance of the church. Let me just stop right here. I'm not washing your nasty feet. You got a bathtub, you got a shower, wash your own feet. Okay? All right? I ain't doing it. Now, if Jesus told me to, I would, but he hadn't, and I won't. Just telling you. Just mark it down. Not washing your feet. Hmm? Listen, in Bible days, they wore sandals, they walked in sand. Their feet got hot, their feet got cracked, their feet got, you know, just, just bad shape. And one symbol of a good host is when you came to their house, they would wash your feet with a... They kept a little pitcher of water, and they'd, they'd wash your feet off, get the sand and get the, uh, all that off your, uh, your feet. That was a sign of being hospitable. Jesus washed his disciples' feet as an example that you would humble yourself to serve one another. Now, here's the key. Foot washing was given as an example of what our attitude should be towards one another. It was never given as a command. The two ordinances we were commanded to keep. Now, let me give you some scripture. John chapter 13, verse 14. <clears throat> The Lord saying this, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. They stop right there. They say, okay, it's an ordinance. We've got to wash them one another's feet. They'll line them up in the front row. Go down and wash feet. I bet Aaron Ellis has got in on some of them services. No, I'm just teasing. I know you have, Ray. I know where you're from. But verse 15 is the key. So you can take any one verse out of context and make it mean anything. Verse 15 says this, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. It's more of an attitude of mind than an actual act of washing feet. But it was done for an example. Now listen to the two commands for the ordinances. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. That's a command. Go. Then in Luke 22, verse 19, And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Again, it's a command. The ordinances were commanded... Foot washing was just an example, all right? Now, let's talk about baptism. Baptism is the heart and soul of Baptist theology. It's the heart and soul. It's what separates us. We told you early on, doctrine divides. This one certainly divides us from everybody else. Theolo uh, theologically... Baptism stands for our belief in a personal, intelligent faith in Christ, a regenerate, voluntary church membership, and a gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's what it means when you look at it in a theological sense. Historically, tenacious uh, baptism shows tenacious allegiance to the doctrine of baptism and it's resulted in the cruel suffering of our Baptist forebears by way of tortures, edicts, banishments, and death. Do you know even in America, John Williams, Baptist preacher, New England, was banished from New England for being a Baptist? Do you know that in Virginia it was illegal to be a Baptist? And that through revival... Four out of five Virginians became Baptists, and the reason we have the doctrine of separation church and state in the Constitution is they wanted to make uh, John Leland the first governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. He was a Baptist preacher. He wasn't interested in politics. He was interested in being a Baptist preacher. But uh, James Madison wanted to be 
uh, the governor and he said, I tell you what, I'll throw all my support to you if you promise us freedom of religion. And that's why it's in your Constitution. You realize uh, a lot of the framework of the Constitution is because of Baptists? Hmm. Distinctively, baptism is the emblem of soul liberty and the true separation of the powers of church and state. In England, they had a church-sponsored religion. Rome had a church-sponsored religion. Throughout the world, if you didn't worship the way they did, you were an outlaw. But being baptized shows your soul liberty that you are choosing to align yourself with the Baptist faith. You know in Mexico, Brother Luther Spivey gave us this towel. He's got 150-something churches. They'll have campaigns where they'll preach. And hundreds of people get saved in a service. Now, Mexico is 98% Roman Catholic. Those people know that if they get baptized, they won't be able to buy groceries at the grocery store. They won't be able to uh, uh, work most places. And they know that the Catholic priests will blackball them and tell everybody to banish them, not have anything to do with them. But you know those folks that get born again in Mexico, they don't want to wait. They want to get baptized that night. Luther says the services will last till 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning just baptizing people that have gotten saved because they want to make a stand so much because of what God's done in their heart. It's an amazing thing. And then practically when it comes to baptism... Baptism defines the work of the Lord, that of winning the lost to Christ through preaching, uh, preaching the very message pictured by the ordinance, then establishing churches from those who believe and are baptized. Baptism is the first step in obedience to the will of God. All right? So let's look at the importance of baptism. This is a tremendous statement right here. Catholicism has polluted the ordinance. Uh, the Protestants have perverted it. Uh, the interdenominational crowd would parry it. They want to imitate it. But most of them only baptize in Jesus' name only. The ecumenical movement seeks to paraphrase it. But the Baptists have given life and limb to preserve it. Very important. Why? Why is baptism so important? Why have people gave their lives to protect this wonderful doctrine? Well, first of all, because it obeys Christ's command. He commanded us to repent, and then He commanded us to be baptized. It follows Christ's example. Christ wasn't a sinner, but He got baptized. Why? He submitted to the will of God. It's the first step in obedience to the will of God. It admits one into church membership. You don't become a member of a local church without being baptized. It also identifies one with Christ. We'll bring this out in a minute, but the baptism, the baptismal pool is a picture of a liquid grave. Those of us that are born again, we've died out to sin by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're buried with Him in baptism, and then we're raised in newness of life. It identifies us with Christ. It also uh, is accepting the whole counsel of God. Now let me give you some verse, uh, verses on it. In Luke chapter 7, uh, Jesus shows up. John's baptizing Jesus as converts. And the whole crowd's there. I mean, there's everybody there, including the Pharisees. Listen to what, what, what the Bible says. And all the people that heard him... And the publicans, or the sinners, justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of Him. When we aren't baptized, scripturally baptized, we're rejecting the counsel of God. But by being scripturally baptized... We're fulfilling the counsel of God in our life. All right? 
Let me give you the requirements for scriptural baptism. Now, I say that because there's a lot of people baptizing, but they're not doing it scripturally. Again, why are we having to stay? Because we won't do everything scripturally. Okay? Uh, scriptural baptism has some requirements. The first, uh, there has to be a proper applicant or candidate. The scripture is very clear what it takes to be a candidate to be baptized. Very clear. Uh, you've got to be a believer first. Hmm? Let me give you some verses. Acts chapter 8, verse 36. I'm talking about Philip and the eunuch. As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. Now let me set the stage. Philip has left a great revival at Jerusalem. The Spirit of God tells him, leave. As he's leaving, there's a chariot with a eunuch on it going down to Jordan. He joins himself to the chariot, the Lord tells him to, and the eunuch's reading Isaiah 53. And Philip said, Understandest what thou readest? He said, How can I except some man show me? So Philip begins preaching to him from that passage, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says this, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Listen to the answer. Verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. You have to believe before you can be baptized. Somebody gets baptized before they're a believer, they're just a wet sinner. The Bible said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You've got to believe on the Lord, not believe in the Lord. Can I say the Bible says the devils believe and fear and tremble. It's not enough to believe that Jesus existed. It's not enough to believe that he was a babe born in a manger and we have Christmas because of that. It's not enough to believe that he died on the cross. It's not enough to believe that he resurrected from the dead. It's not enough to believe that he's Lord. You've got to believe on him. What does that mean? That means you have to turn from whatever you've trusted in and turn to him and believe on him. Ask him to save you from your sins. And so we find that he believed with all his heart, and then he got baptized. Acts chapter 9, the great apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. In verse number 6 it says, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Rise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Saul's on, his, on the road to Damascus on his way to go persecute and kill Christians. The Lord appears unto him, and great light knocks him off his horse. When he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord tells him who he is. I'm Jesus. Thou to kick us against the pricks. He says, I'm the one you're fighting against. And Paul says, Lord, what wilt thou? Saul of Tarsus got born again right there. He believed on him. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He said, Go in the city. Now what happens when he goes to the city? Verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. He believed, then he was baptized. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Or no, Acts chapter 8, verse 18. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord. Didn't say believed in the Lord. Believed on the Lord with all his house. His whole house got saved. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. They believed, then they were baptized. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth, believe first, and is baptized, second, shall be saved. There's an order. You believe, then you're baptized. Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent, believe on the Lord, turn, and be baptized. You see the order. So the proper applicant for baptism is somebody who has believed on the Lord. Okay? Then there's the proper act or mode of baptism. How do we baptize? Some sprinkle, some take a little cup of water, pour on their head, and some douse them. The word baptize simply means to immerse. Means that in the Greek, means that in the Latin, means it in English. Means to immerse in the water. Okay? Now, 
I'm going to read you some verses. Tell me how you get sprinkling or pouring a cup of water out of these verses. Okay? Matthew 3.16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Now, when you sprinkle somebody, they're not coming out of the water. In order to come out of the water, you have to go in the water. Okay? Uh, John 3.23, And John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem, because there was much water there. You don't need a lot of water to sprinkle somebody. But he had a big crowd, and he needed much water. Hmm? And he said, and they came and were baptized. And going back to Philip in the eunuch, Acts 8, 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. In verse 39, and that when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. What did he do? He went down into the water, and then he come up out of the water. He wasn't sprinkled. He wasn't had a little cup of water dumped on his head. He was immersed in the water. And let me give you a little history. You realize the Catholic Church immersed even infants up through the 1400s, some as late as the 1600s? They immersed, but it became inconvenient. And plus, so many people were questioned and said, well, that's what the Baptists do down there. So they had to dis differentiate themselves, so they started sprinkling. You know, can I help you with this? Queen Elizabeth I, who was born in 1533, she was baptized in the Catholic Church. She was immersed uh, at the Cathedral of Milan, and that was in the 1500s. And they have that on record. Both the Reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, both Protestants, both of them said baptism had to be immersion. And then uh, Martin Luther, getting a little pushback, being called a Baptist, went back to sprinkling like the Catholic Church was doing. Okay? So the proper mode or proper act is immersion. Proper candidate has to believe. Then there's the proper argument or motive. Baptism does not wash away your sin. The only thing that can cleanse you from your sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, He doesn't physically wash us in His blood, but when somebody believes on the Lord, there is a supernatural event that takes place. The Holy Spirit of God does an operation in your fleshly heart. He cuts away the fleshly part and He moves in. And He seals you unto the day of redemption. The moment you confess your sins, the very blood that Jesus shed on Calvary is at the mercy seat before the throne of God and that blood is applied to your life the moment you believe uh, and Jesus then writes you down in the Lamb's Book of Life and there's a record of your salvation. But baptism doesn't wash away your sin. If it could, why did Jesus have to die that terrible death? The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission for sins. Mm, but um, baptism is just a symbol as I said a minute ago, of what has already taken place in your heart. It pictures the gospel. The believers died to sin and raised in newness of life. Let me give you the verse. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized unto his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of, uh, of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. And again, if you don't go all the way into, into water, how are you being uh, identified with His death? And if you're not raised uh, out of the grave in the newness of life, you can't get that through sprinkling. First hmm? Peter 3.21 says this, the like figure, or the symbol, or the picture, 
whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, water doesn't wash away your sins. But what baptism does in doing the first work of obedience to God, it gives you a good conscience toward God. And that's, my dear friend, something the world can't give you. Having peace and a good conscience towards God. So we see the proper argument or motive. Then there's the proper authority. Who can baptize? Well, my dear friends, what are we talking about? The ordinance of what? The church. The church is the only institution ordained of God to have the authority to baptize its converts. Individuals don't have that authority. That's important. As the ecumenical movement and the non-denominational movement and the, the feel-good Pentecostal movement has taken over, they think anybody can just go anywhere and baptize people. You don't have authority. Again, I'm the under-shepherd of this church. The church confers me authority, being the under-shepherd, being the pastor, but that authority is the church's, not mine. That is so important. We once had a fellow... Uh, uh, just show up at one of our uh, jail services and wanted to go in and preach and all that and, and was upset when we didn't let him. And he called me. He says, you mean I can't do that? I said, no. I said, you have no authority. That is the Emmanuel Baptist Church's jail service. And I said, whose authority are you here under? He, he, he kind of stumbled a little bit. He said, well, my church. I said, let me ask you a question. Does your pastor know that you're here trying to hoard in on our jail service? He said, well, no, but he told me I can go anywhere I want to go. When I... No, you don't have that authority. So it's important. Authority is important. The authority of the Word of God. The authority of the church. Why? Because God has a divine order. And when we adhere to the order of God, everything's good. We get things out of order and you get confusion, chaos. Just look at our country. Hmm? They don't even know that God didn't create Adam and Steve. Just thought I'd throw that in. Hmm? The proper authority is the local churches. Now, with that said, the pastor don't have to be the one who is the baptizer. 99.9% .9 of the time he is. But he can appoint deacons or any man in good standing to do the baptizing because the authority is the church. Okay? And can I help you something? It don't matter who baptizes you. It matters, how, it matters that you're baptized in the proper mode and the proper authority. You remember what uh, there was an argument in the church of Corinth. And some said, Paulo's baptized me. Paul baptized me. Paul said, some, water, some plant, some water, God gives the increase. It doesn't matter who, it matters that you did it, and you did it scripturally. Okay? So that's baptism. I hope uh, I didn't rush through that too much. But uh, we got a little bit of time. Let's look at the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> You're listening fast. The Lord's Supper, again, is a doctrine misunderstood amongst many Baptist churches. I'll never forget a few years ago, I went on vacation, left a guy, you know, as a preacher in the church, uh, teach Sunday school, and he taught on the Lord's Supper. Number one, that's not anybody's responsibility outside the pastor. Number two, he taught it wrong. Fortunately, folks sitting here had heard me teach on it. And they recognize the joker's crazy. And so what happened? They told me. I got back into town. I listened to it. And the guy said a lot of things that were right. But he said some things that were wrong. So I called him and said, look. Here's what you said that was right. Here's what you said that was wrong. I said, now, you really need to go before church and say, I'm sorry I didn't understand that properly. 
I said, because I've got to stand up and tell them what you said was wrong. Well, being the good, strong, independent Baptist that he was, he never showed back up. You know? Because that's what people do when they get embarrassed rather than admit, hey, I was stupid, I shouldn't have said that. No, they'll just cut ties and go mess up some other congregation somewhere. All right? So anyway, that didn't cost you anything extra. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Let's talk about the Lord's Supper, the second ordinance. In the Lord's Supper, there's a symbolism to be demonstrated in the observance of it. It all pictures something. There's a strictness demanded for the observance of it. It's not to be done as a ritual. It's not to be done lightly. The Lord's Supper is the most solemn service that we'll ever have. Uh, the solemnness that is desirable uh, during the observance of it, there's a solemnness that you long for. It, it, is a, it is a very disturbing thought to realize that we're observing this because it was my sin that caused this. Okay? Now, like baptism, the Lord's Supper's authority is in the local church, not the believer. That's so important. I've got to say it again. Because this is where people get wrong on it. The authority is the local churches, not the believer. Okay? Now, uh, we talked about what it took to be a candidate for baptism. What are the prerequisites to one being eligible to partake in the Lord's Supper? Uh, first of all, there has to be the new birth. Somebody that's not saved can't partake of the Lord's Supper. Secondly, you have to be scripturally baptized. Uh, if you're not scripturally baptized, you're not a candidate for the Lord's Supper. And thirdly, it takes church membership. If you're not a member of the church, I'm sorry, you can't partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, when we do administer it, I have a meeting with the deacons beforehand and the associate or whoever help else is going to help us distribute. And I try to the best of my ability to let them know who's a candidate, who's not a candidate. If there are people that are, are faithful visitors but not members, people that's not been baptized, I let them know because when we administer the Lord's Supper, we serve it. We just don't let anybody free fall and partake of it. Now, there are three common practices in observing the Lord's Supper. There's what's called open communion, where those churches believe anybody saved can take of it. Then there's what's called close communion. Close communion says that as long as you're a Baptist, you can partake of it. And then there's closed communion. Uh, closed communion says only members of this local assembly can partake in the Lord's Supper. Now Paul wrote in his epistles to the churches, and every one of them he wrote for them to be like-minded, to be of the same accord or the same mind. Okay, The term communion simply means to be in agreement to have intimate fellowship, to share, or to have commonality. Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, the definition of close, as in close communion, says this, having a space in between, almost, to be near. Now, that's not the same as having communion. There's a space. You're almost there. Okay? Now, one salvation in sincerity is not in question here. Uh, if somebody's saved, that has nothing to do with taking the Lord's Supper. You've got to be the proper candidate. No, I'm sincere, preacher. I want to take it. Well, if you're not a member of this church and we offer the Lord's Supper, you're not taking it. And we're going to show you why in a minute. Uh, listen, 
I don't baptize other churches' members. How could I be responsible for another church's member's spirituality? You see, part of being the under-shepherd, I have to make certain the church is in a spirit where it's able to receive the Lord's Supper and they're not tempted to take of it unworthily. How can I do that for somebody I don't even know? Somebody that's not under my authority. And again, this is an ordinance of the church. And so in order to participate, you've got to be a member of this church. It's just common sense. But people get their feelings all caught up in it. Well, I'm saved. Wonderful. But what, if we're having the Lord's Supper, you're not taking it. You can sit there and watch, but you're not taking it. So, you say, Brother Doug, you're awful mean. Well, the Bible's very clear. So you're awful narrow-minded. Yeah, about that narrow, right there. That's how narrow my mind is. Okay? All right. Um, now listen. Uh, the purpose for the ordinance is to bring to our remembrance the price for our sin and to remember where our glory and where our praise should lie until Jesus returns. Now look again in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Just look at the first part of verse 26. I want you to see this. Now look, look at the verse. Verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death when? Till he come. So that's part of the purpose of it, to remember what he paid for, or you know, paid, that was the price he paid for our sin, and we're to do it to his glory until he returns. All right? Now, let's talk about the ordinance. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives very, very clear definition to partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now, I want you to notice verse 23. The Bible says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And the first thing we need to know is that Jesus was betrayed by a professed friend. Now, let that sink in for a minute. Judas Iscariot, for three and a half years, went everywhere Jesus went. For three and a half years, he saw every miracle Jesus did, from the, from the marriage at Cana, when he turned the water into wine, unto raising the dead. And Isaiah th chapter 35 makes it clear, the only one that can raise the dead and, and give sight to the blind is the Lord himself. He saw blinded eyes open, saw the healed and the crippled uh, 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 the crippled healed and the withered hands healed. He saw uh, Jesus take a few loaves and a few fishes and feed the multitude. There were 5,000 men, not counting women and children. They say could have been 15,000 people there that Jesus fed with five loaves and two fishes. He saw every miracle that Jesus did. He heard every message that Jesus preached. And yet he still betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Now we know why, because he never really believed on the Lord. He was in the crowd. He was amongst them, but he wasn't one of them. And that's very important, because if out of 12, one of them didn't believe on the Lord. How many people in a building of 200 really hasn't believed on the Lord? If one went everywhere Jesus did, heard everything Jesus preached, saw everything Jesus did, and he betrayed him, and don't tell me that folks that have never seen him or never heard his audible voice wouldn't betray him. It's a serious thing. Can I say? I want you to notice the broken bread in verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now, they, the, the bread that is to be served in the Lord's table was unleavened bread. It's not sweet. It's bitter. Because it was a bitter pill for Jesus to die the death that he died. 
He despised the shame. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You say, what, what, what's that all about? Oh, he hated being spit upon. He hated being mocked by the very ones he created. He hated being stripped and beaten and put before a, a p open chain. But he looked ahead in time and saw you and I believing on him. And he said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Amen. But my dear friends, when we partake of the bread, it is a picture or a symbol that is important. You remember I've said that a few times. It is a picture of the Lord's body. He said, and when he given thanks, he break it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now when Jesus instituted this, you'll find it in Matthew 26, you'll find it in Mark 14, I believe, and you'll find it in Luke 22, I believe. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, they didn't eat his flesh. He didn't say, here, eat my finger. He broke the bread and gave them that and said, this is my body. When you eat it, this do and remembers me. This is what I'm giving for you. Jesus became broken bread and poured out wine for us on Calvary. They did not physically eat the Lord Jesus. They ate the bread, which was a picture of the Lord Jesus. Why is that important? In the Catholic Mass, when the, the priest says a prayer, he's... Uh, symbolically what he is saying is that he is literally turning the Eucharist, the bread, and the wine into the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say that's gross. We don't eat the Lord. This is a symbol that we eat this bitter bread to get a, a remembrance of what Jesus did for us. Now what is also important about if they really said a prayer that turned the, the Eucharist and, and the wine into the Lord's body and blood, they are re-crucifying Jesus every Mass service. And yet the writer of Hebrews says He was offered once for all. He only died on the cross once. He's never dying again. As a matter of fact, he told John in Revelation, he said, I'm he that was dead, was buried, and rose again. I have the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He said, I'm alive forevermore. Yep. He's not dying again. Again, this is a symbol. It's a picture. It's not literal. Very important. Now notice with me in verse 24, he says, this do in remembrance of me. That word remembrance to recall a deep, lively, vivid impression. When we have the Lord's Supper, we always read the account of crucifixion. So it's fresh in our minds how he was beaten, how his beard was plucked from his face, how there was a crown of thorns plaited on his head how he was beaten with many stripes and how they mocked him, put a purple robe on him and they bowed before him, they committed a reed to his hand and even that frail, crisp reed wouldn't break in his hand because anything committed to Jesus, he takes care of it. And we bring the vivid picture of him carrying his cross and then yielding himself to his cross and they pierced his hands and his feet. We do that to get that vivid remembrance that he did that because he loved you and he loved me. The cup of wine, in verse 25. After the same manner, also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Now we brought out last week or the week before, I can't remember, about the laws of fermentation, that Jesus never drank any real wine or what we would consider wine. He drank grape juice. I bring that out because there's even independent Baptist churches that use real wine in the Lord's Supper. Can I help you with something? I never want to see any of these children ever take a, a taste, a, a drop of liquor, a drop of booze. But I sure would hate for them to ever do it, but if they ever did it, I'd hate for their first taste to be at the church house. That's not what Jesus taught. Again, we brought it out. 
why would he say strong drink is a mockery and then tell us to drink fermented grape juice? Huh? He doesn't. And by the way, Jesus gets your heart, he gets your taste buds too. I drink all the booze I want to drink. I just don't want to. Huh? I'm drinking from another well. Huh? I got to hurry. Um, the wine's a picture of the blood that he shed. Again, we said without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The New Testament is contingent on the blood of Jesus Christ. That's important. The Methodists started taking blood, the blood out of, out of their songbooks. Uh, the non-denominational crowd teaches we are saved by his death. We're saved by his blood. If it was his death, why didn't he die of a heart attack? Why didn't he die of COVID? No, he died the torturous death of the cross. All those Old Testament sacrifices, those were... I, I mean, you know, we don't think about that, but you think about raising a lamb, taking it to the high priest, holding that lamb still, and watching that lamb being scared while that high priest slit, his, slit its throat, then hang it up and drain the blood out of it into a basin, and then skin that thing, then part all the pieces and burn it on the burnt offering. Doesn't sound like a church service I want to go to. Huh? And in some of those uh, services, like when David would offer up 700 sheep, can you imagine the smell of death around that place? Wasn't pleasant. Wasn't churchy. The death Jesus died was uh, 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 to take the place or be the Lamb of God to show all those Old Testament sacrifices just a picture of what He was going to do. Wasn't anything pleasant. Very important, verse 26. The Bible says, For as often as ye eat this cup, or eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. I'm interested where it says, For as often as. Now the scriptures do not say, Do this often. The Lord's Supper is not to be a ritual, it is not to be bastardized. It is not to be done so often that it has no meaning or no significance. But what is teaching when you do it, however often that is, be very sober about it. Uh, I firmly believe the only time the Lord's Supper is to be offered, not at Christmas and Easter, not every service like a lot of the Protestant churches, the only time the church is in a position to receive the Lord's Supper is when the church is in a state of revival, and I'll prove that to you here in a minute. <clears throat> Matter of fact, look back in verse 18. I want you to see this. Verse 18 says, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be, able to manif be, may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and the other is drunken. The, the Lord's Supper is to be for the church's edification, not the church's enjoyment. Okay? Now, I said I'm going to prove to you that it's not to be done as a ritual. Look at verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Look at verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, 
not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, what was this talking about? If you do it as a ritual, you are tempting people to take it unworthily. And if you take it unworthily, you're guilty of the body of the Lord Jesus. And you're also bringing damnation to yourself. That's very important. Now, one reason that it's a local church ordinance and I can't be responsible for somebody else's sheep, I might tempt them to take it unworthily. I don't know where they come from. Again, it's a very, very serious, serious thing. And I say this, that the Lord's Supper, when it's given, before it's administered, there's always a period of self-examination. Look at verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. People need to do a little inventory and ask the Lord, am I worthy to take of this tonight? There's no shame in not taking it. It'd be better you don't take it than take it unworthily. And then we see the judgment if you do take it unworthily. We find in verse 29, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. He said many are sickly and weak, and then many sleep. That word sleep means they're in the grave. It's a dangerous thing to play with the things of God. There's a lot of folks that play hooky on the things of God, and then they wonder why things don't always work out for them, why they're always sickly, and why they always got things going on. God's business is serious business. Let me say this lastly, and I'll be done tonight. I want you to notice verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. The Lord makes it clear in Hebrews chapter number 12 that He chastens His children. It says, if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard, not a son. But here it says, if we'll judge ourselves, we won't be judged. Now notice, Brother Bob, it didn't tell me I was to judge you. How can I judge you? I can't see what's in your heart. I don't even know what's in my heart. I have to ask the Lord to reveal it to me. We're not to judge somebody else. Well, why are they taking it? As a matter of fact, it's a good practice when the Lord's Supper is being administered. Just keep your head down. Just look within instead of looking around. The Lord's Supper is a precious service. It's a humbling service when you recall vividly what it took for you to get to go to heaven for you to be a part of the Lord's church for you to carry his name Christian wherever you go a very very solemn service we've looked at baptism we've looked at the Lord's Supper the ordinance of the church and trust me I could go on and on and on on those two topics but for the sake of our study I wanted to hit the highlights Lord willing next week we'll look at uh, a couple of other things concerning the church and we'll try and wrap the church aspect of this up as soon as possible and get to other things my dear friends y'all never be ashamed you're Baptist Amen. There was a push that started in the 80s and it's become common practice now that a lot of Baptists are taking Baptists off the name. They say, we'll get more people when they're offended by that name Baptist. You know why they're offended? Because it stood for something. Hmm? Uh, I'll just make this statement. As long as I'm pastor here, we're going to be the Emmanuel Baptist Church. As long as I'm pastor here, we're going to use the King James Bible. Now, if you all vote to change on any of that, I'll uh, wave at you on the way out of town, okay? Because I'm not interested in anything. I'm proud of our heritage. I'm proud of this book and the truths contained therein. I'm, I'm proud to stand for something. When David showed up there when, when 
Israel was hauled up on the mountain and Goliath down there cursing them, David said, is there not a cause? There's a cause to stand. There's even a cause to fight. And there are some things worth fighting for. Your family's worth fighting for. Your church is worth fighting for. The Bible's worth fighting for. Huh? Our country's worth fighting for. There are some things worth fighting for. And uh, thank the Lord there's been a group for 2,000 years had a little grit about them. Didn't waver, didn't, didn't, didn't cave, didn't, didn't really concern themselves with what everybody else thought. They just lived by the Bible. When you live by the Bible, you might not be popular, but you'll have the peace of God in your soul. And I'd rather be popular with Jesus than the whole world. Amen. All right, we're done right there. All right, I, 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 I hate not to have an invitation service, so we're going to have one. Never know, somebody just might want to come tonight and thank God for having turkey to eat tomorrow, or ham, or SpaghettiOs, whatever you're going to have. Bob and Sonny do pizza on Thanksgiving. They're weird. Huh? Huh? Hey, maybe you want to come thank the Lord for that. Maybe you want to thank Him you got the truth. You know, it's only by the grace of God you're not Hindu tonight. It's only by the grace of God you're not an atheist, one raised in an atheist home. Maybe you want to come tonight and bless the Lord for just loving you. Maybe he spoke to you about something else. Well, tonight be a good night to get it set. So let's all stand, Miss Renee, come play something. God spoke to your heart. You just mind the Lord, all right? Folks are coming. She's going to play something. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for truth. Lord, I'm reminded, and we'll bring it out, but I'm reminded, and you said you didn't come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword. And truth and doctrine divides, Lord. Lord, you said over there that that crowd that left said they were not of us, for if they would have been of us, they would not have left us. The truth divides. I understand that. And I'm thankful for truth. I'm thankful for the reality of heaven. I'm thankful for the reality that you framed the world. I'm thankful for the reality that you went to Calvary and shed your blood that we could be saved. And I'm thankful that we know these things because of the Word of God. Now, Lord, I thank you for these dear folks. Lord, come out and heard me ramble. Tried to teach them some things. So, Lord, I pray you'd help them to absorb truth, get it down on the gable end of their soul so they'd know when to stand and what to stand for. When folks have come to the altar, Lord, you know the need of their hearts and what they're there for. Bless them. God, we certainly pray if there's somebody here tonight like Judas Iscariot when he was with you at the Last Supper and don't know you, I pray they'd come to trust in Christ before it's too late. Have your will and way now, Father. We'll thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.